Nocturne number 11 in D major. This is, I will admit, one of my most favorite nocturnes out of both books, not only because it's written in my favorite key of D major, which is that nice, bright, optimistic, happy key, but I also chose a very unusual meter for a nocturne. I don't think I've ever seen a nocturne in 5-8 before, but now you have one, and this particular nocturne is one that's rather uh, vertical in construction. It's, you'll find a lot more chords underneath the melody. So voicing uh, on that top note all the way through is going to be really, really critical to get that beautiful lyrical singing sound that we need to have. Let me just start in the opening of this and let you hear what it sounds like. You'll also notice that the right-hand melody consists all the way through of very, very small intervals, either half, uh, half steps or whole steps. Uh, there are no leaps there, but there's lots of interesting chord changes almost on every single eighth note. In measure 16, at the bottom of this page, there's a beautiful spot where the chord changes to an, an E flat seven chord, and I want to really take some time over that bar line, just really breathe over that bar line and make this so expressive because the dynamic comes way down to mezzo piano as well. And this is a, a, a gorgeous spot in the first page. What I sometimes do is on the last beat before that bar line, I will add an and to the rhythm if I'm counting out loud. In this case, it would be one, two, three, four, five, and one, just to give that little emphasis uh, over the bar line and not rush into it. So I really took my time on that roll as well. The next section of this nocturne has a more difficult left hand in 16th notes all the way through. Uh, you know, Chopin loved doing interesting things in the left hand, and so do I, especially in this particular book of Nocturne. So it's important to really follow the fingering uh, that I've given in the book. It makes it much easier to play. There's chromatic patterns going up, chromatic patterns going down. There are changes of, of uh, keys, very sudden modulations. One that I particularly love is going into measure 25. If I were to start in measure 24 with that descending chromatic pattern in the left hand, it would sound like this. Again, the tempo needs to be moving forward all the time. If it goes too slow, it's just, it's really going to drag. There is a beautiful spot at the top of the third page, starting in measure 31. I build up, build up, and we finally get to a big, big forte at the top of that page in F minor. Let me start in measure 29. So if we take a little bit of time again, going into the forte, it sounds a bit more convincing. We have uh, another kind of rather inharmonic modulation in measure 32, which brings us back to the original key of D major. At the bottom of this third page, there's another very important spot where I want the pianist to really create a big, rich, full sound at that fortissimo. Let me start in measure 39 and uh, demonstrate the sound that I would love to hear. If I really get into that low D octave with my whole body, I just want to play into the very bottom of that key to create the richest, richest sound that I can possibly get. 
At the end of this piece, um, the melody actually transfers back and forth between left hand and right hand. In measure 51, you'll notice the tenuto markings that I put above the left hand notes, and then it moves over in the next measure into the top of the right hand. We have <laughs> 